What's up cats and kittens, your old pal Gas Bandit here with a little follow-up tutorial to the last one. There's a few more basic concepts I thought were important enough to merit a second planet-specific tutorial. Specifically, I'd like to talk about rovers, how exactly you go about finding minerals on a planet, and configuring your base's solar panels so that they continually adjust themselves to the position of the sun. First, let's talk about rovers. When you're flying around near a planet, gravity creates a constant pull on your ship, so your engines are constantly having to fight hard to keep you in the air. That requires drastically more power than zero-gravity spaceflight. And when you're just getting started, uranium is really scarce and you're forced to rely on batteries recharged by solar power instead of nuclear reactors. A much more economical use of power to get around in a vehicle is to build a rover. A battery will usually keep you in the air for a matter of minutes, maybe an hour if you have lots of them and don't move around much. But a small form factor rover can go literally for days on a single battery charge. Here's a basic design I came up with just to get things started. It's nothing fancy, easy and quick to build from the parts you start out with in the atmospheric lander in a star system survival start. I used the largest wheels available as the small ones aren't really that useful. And also made sure to stick on an ore detector and an antenna so it can broadcast the location of mineral ores to my suit even when I'm not in it. This particular rover can be expected to go almost 72 hours on one battery charge, even with all systems on. When you're first getting started, the cargo capacity of the connector alone is usually enough for a few armloads of ore. And when you need more and power is less of a factor, you can swap out the horizontal solar panel for three medium cargo bays easily. A word about suspension is pretty important, though. When you first build your wheels, the suspension strength will be set to zero which means your rover will sag all the way to the bottom of its shock absorbers, and driving will be pretty rough. To help alleviate this, I like to set my suspension strength to between 5 and 10%. 5% or so is good for an empty rover, and you'll need to set it higher as you load the rover down with more and heavier cargo. Try not to set it too stiff, however, or it will make the rover difficult to handle and prone to glitching. Speaking of glitching, it's also a good idea to set your wheels to have the max speed of between 100 and 120 kilometers per hour. The game's still alpha and buggy as hell, and bad things happen when rovers are going fast. The temptation to open up the throttle and see what she's made of when you're out on a nice flat ice lake is hard to resist. But it's a surefire way to flip over, or worse, fall through the world. But treat her gentle and keep her down around 100 and a rover will be your best friend for getting around easily and cheaply on a planet. Let's talk about finding minerals next. Whether you're in a rover or in the air, it's very time consuming to just run around with your ore detector hoping for a random find. Fortunately, there's a trick to it. As you look around at the terrain, you'll see there are darker patches. I'm not talking about the difference between green and yellow. I mean green and dark green, yellow and brown, and even the dark patches you might see in ice. These are visual clues that tell you that there are minerals underneath. Just drive or later fly around looking for these dark patches. Then when you find one, position yourself over it and tilt the camera down. Make a mental note of what minerals you detect, then go to your GPS tab in your control panel and create a new waypoint for your current location. Then rename it to indicate the minerals you found. This way you can scout out several locations in one trip, then come back later with equipment to dig it out, or perhaps a dedicated mining vehicle. If the strike is rich enough, you may even want to build a small mining satellite base. Lastly, let's talk about lining up your solar panels. To get maximum power from your solar panels, you're going to need them to track along with the sun as it traverses the sky. There are scripts on the workshop for programmable blocks that claim to be able to do this for you automatically, but I never really got them to work as well as this simple method I'm about to show you. I'm assuming here that you didn't mess with the default day length, and so a game day lasts two hours. You might need to adjust the map accordingly if you did set your map's day to be longer or shorter. Anyway, when you build your solar array, don't try to make it symmetrical. Make one side just a little longer than the other so that it is off-center ever so slightly. This is easy to accomplish if you only use solar panels and no other blocks when you build the array. Naturally, you'll want to build the array on a rotor attached at a 90-degree angle to another rotor that is pointing up. When night comes around, turn off the top horizontal rotor. The imbalanced weight of the solar panel will make the rotor turn freely, and by the time it settles down, the array will be pointing the panels exactly at the horizon. Leave the rotor off but set its RPM to 0.0083. The math here is that if you want the array to make exactly one turn per day, you take that one RPM, divide it by 60 to get one revolution per hour, then divide that by two to get one revolution every two hours, then wait for sunrise. You'll know it's close to sunrise when the green haze line in the sky starts to touch the western horizon. Then when you can see the first sliver of the actual sun disk, turn on the top horizontal rotor. Now the horizontal rotor will slowly turn keeping the array pointed at the angle of the sun. It's not perfect because the RPM we actually needed was 0.00833333 repeating, but the game truncates it, so every few days you'll probably have to make a small adjustment. 
The easiest way to do this is just to turn the rotor off again right before sunrise, then turn it back on again the instant you see the sun's top sliver, same as before. Now chances are the solar panel still isn't pointing directly at the sun, unless you happen to build right on the equator. You'll need to turn the lower vertical rotor a bit, but this one will be stationary once it's aligned. To figure out where it needs to be, move around the pillar on which your solar array is mounted until you're pointed right at your shadow on the pillar. Then fly up to the vertical rotor and take note of the number. Here the number is just over 225 degrees, but if I set the rotor to 225, it will be pointing the solar panels the way I'm facing, which won't catch any sunlight because my rotor's angle indicator has zero aligned to the axis of the solar array. So I'll need to add 90 degrees so that the array's side is facing the sun to get 315 degrees. It was actually a few degrees higher than 225, so I set the rotor's limits to be about 318 degrees. Once it calms down, you'll see that it's more or less pointed the flat sides of your solar panels right at the sun, or as close enough as makes no difference. Then you can go off and attend to other matters for a couple days knowing that your batteries will be charging as fast as you can easily make them do so. I think that's enough for this time, you guys. Keep on keeping on, and I'll catch you later. <laughs>